God for what I feel. And somebody said, well, you can't live on feelings. I get it. Fair enough. But you also can't live without them either. And so people that don't have feelings hurt themselves, get burned. They don't understand their relative distance to fires, to dangers. You've got to have feeling. All of this is an indicator of where I am in relationship to the presence of God. I want to feel His presence. And I thank God that we can feel Him here this morning. Man, I want to invite you to the book of Matthew today. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 12. While you're turning there, I want to say welcome to everybody that is here. We pray, this is our prayer, that when this service is over, two things have happened. Namely, you have a greater view and an increased faith in God. And secondarily, that you have moved yourself in that faith towards him and what he can do in your life. That's the whole point of this. That is the whole point of this, to come and to hear the word of God. We want to thank everybody who has been attending our Faithful to God services, which are every day except Sunday at 9 a.m., 2 p.m., and 7 o'clock p.m. God has been good. God has been faithful and we're not, I've been monitoring very close what happens, haven't we? We've been looking, if it, if it seems just make busy or redundant or in some way unnecessary, I would probably do something else. But every time I get up in this place, get to praying and worshiping God with you, I see what God is doing. And to me, it is a worthwhile investment of our time. Amen. Matthew chapter 18 and we will read in verse number 12. How think ye? This is his way of saying, what do you guys think about this? If a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. God bless you today. You may be seated. I would like to preach for the next few moments on this subject, entangled in the land, entangled in the land. Jesus uses this parable, and this is one of the capstone teachings of what is called the Lord's parabolic ministry or teaching. These are sermons, messages, and things that he has spoken that is linked into a parable. And they are ensconced or, or set inside of a story. The story is a, is a word picture that is intended for you to be able to see how Jesus thinks and relates and considers the way that he deals with people. So he asks you, he is kind of doing this by way of a test here, how do you think this will work? He said, if a man has 90 and 9 sheep and one of them, or 100 sheep, one of them goes astray, he leaves the 90 and 9 and he goes after that one which has gone astray. Now, it, it's, it gets a lot of attention here, right? We... We've heard a lot, a lot of preaching about going out of one's way and, and going and finding the lost or scattered sheep and, 
And while all of that is applicable, I would like to move down two sentences into the verse and get more towards the bottom of it in the second way, in the second sentence. And he leaved the ninety and nine. We've done a lot, a lot of preaching on that. But he goeth into the mountains. I want to tell you that living for God is not always convenient. Living for God is not always easy. And the work of restoration and the work of reconciliation is not always easy. It's not as if you have 90 and 9 right here and one wonders over there in the thicket. Sometimes people get lost. Really, really lost. I mean badly lost. Lost in inconvenient places and lost in ways and in means that it is not easy nor convenient to go and to rescue them. They get pulled into things and they get drug out into scenarios and situations. They get lost in the mountains. I remember being in Southern California, we would, we would ride at certain times for certain things. We were on a, a list. I wasn't actually on uh, the San Bernardino County Posse, but we were on the list that when the Posse ran out of search and rescue, they would work their way down to Second Chance Ranch and they could reach out to us. And there was a few times, not many, that we had it worked out where I was in town and I rode for some particular cause. And so you were looking, you are scouting, you are trying to find it. And the, the question that would persist, we would be in certain places in those mountains and you would have this reoccurring thought pinging around your head. If I found them here, or if we found what was lost, how in the world did you get lost out here? What were you doing in the first place to get you turned around in this box canyon? What were you doing in the first place that would have got you this far off of the beaten path? And so we find that a lot of it is not intentional. Nobody sets out to get lost. Nobody, I remember the, the largest uh, case that we had in Southern California is a very, very experienced and avid hiker who was actually a hiking guide around San Gorgonio Mountain, which was the tallest, I think it was almost 12,000 feet above sea level. It was the tallest mountain in Southern California. And he was a hiking guide and he got turned around up there and you think to yourself, I mean, the amount of money, the amount of helicopters and search and rescue, and, and, and finally a military helicopter comes in and avails the search and rescue team of advanced technology and infrared heat mapping where they're going through looking for this advanced hiker. And you think to yourself, how do you do this? And then it dawns on you, well, they didn't do it like that. They didn't set out to get lost. They didn't set out to lose their place. They didn't set out to walk away and lose their setting. But what happened was they just got tangled and turned around out in the country, out in the back country, out in the wilderness, out in the places where it, the paths are not easily marked, where there's no street lights and there's no good mapping that goes along with it. They just simply got trapped out in the country, out in the land. And I think this is my personal feeling today, and I'll show you a few scriptures here in the next five, ten minutes that back up my personal feeling here. I think the devil has a hope for you. I think he's got this little quiet, hidden wish list because he tries to tempt you. He tries to get you to deny God. He tries to get you to declare your agnosticism or lack of belief and knowledge. Or he tries to get you to overtly declare atheistic intent. I don't believe in that. Or what he wants you to do is to say that I denounce God, the work of God. I don't believe in the church. I don't, you know, he wants that. 
but obviously cannot get that with God-fearing people. People that are, that are like all of you, and I make no exceptions or exclusions today. All of you that are in this building, you are a huge disappointment to the devil. He, you have led him down that you are here. He's aggro. So no matter where you're at in your life, I don't know what your home life is. I don't, I don't know what your work life is in your career. I'm just telling you that without exception today, you are a massive disappointment to Satan. Because you will not overtly and outrightly declare, I don't believe in God. I dismiss the whole thing and I'm going to go do what I want to do. There's something about you that you have fear of God and faith in that God that you have all about. And so he can't get you to do some of the things that he hopes that you will do. So he has a wish. He has a hope that in my opinion is not much different than what all slave masters or dictators have a hope for. That when people are trying to get away from their control, they hope they don't make it to freedom. They hope that they don't. That's what enemies do. That's what totalitarian governments do. That's what dictatorial regimes do. They hope you don't make it to freedom. And so let's look at Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14, the Israelites are coming out of Egypt. They're moving out of the land of slavery. They're moving into a place where it is obvious that they will have some traveling challenges and they will have some issues that will come up. In verse number 1 of Exodus 14, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before this place. I didn't, I didn't really parse that out, so I'm afraid to kind of go at it. Between Migdal and the sea, and let them encamp there by that sea. This is what God says Pharaoh is going to hope for. Watch this. This is very powerful. Verse number three. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, and the wilderness hath caught them or shut them in. God, in his wisdom, knew that Pharaoh would say, go on, let them go, let them run. But let's hope that they get entangled in the wilderness. Let's hope that they get into things they can't get out of. Let's hope they get themselves involved in paths that they can't know how to return. You know what the prayer of the wish of the devil is today? Not necessarily that you quit coming to church. It's not that you quit believing in God. His hope is that you get trapped in the land you're living in. His hope is that you get so carried away with the cares of this life that you can't be attentive on God's graces, on God's word, on God's spirit. His hope is that you do not come to God because you're trapped in your own indecisiveness, that you're trapped in carnality, that we are trapped in the world that you live in. We know that not everything that is a hindrance to us is sin. Jesus taught us and said that there will be many that have their hearts overcharged with the cares of this life. Let me just tell you something. Most people do not have a walk with God, not because they have so much sin in their life, but because they have so much business in their life. You do not have to commit sin in order to lose your touch with God. You can get so busy you get caught in your own busyness. You get entrapped, entangled in the land, and the land has a way of just swallowing up your attention and swallowing up your allegiances and swallowing up your, your affirmations and convictions, and you never get around to saying, I don't go to church anymore, because you wouldn't say that. Because you're good and godly and God-fearing people. And so that would never be formulated to be articulated, right? 
Nobody's going to say, I quit God when you're in the shape and position that we are all in. But how do those who quit God not quit church? Well, they're too God-fearing and too lovely of a person and too good and too kind of an individual to just outright say, I quit. I don't want nothing to do with that. They'll never say that. Because then their wife will push back or their husband will push back. The pastor is going to call and say, man, I heard you quit. That really troubles me. I, is there anything I can do to get you to come back to the table of the Lord and see the goodness of God? And you're going to have to start that whole conversation all over again. And so most people don't quit like that. Most people just get swallowed up in how busy they are. And Satan says, I'll never get them to say they're not Israelites. I'll never get them to, to say that they don't want their freedom. I'll never get them to do it. But if, if I can just get life to swallow them up. And the next thing you know is that you're getting wrapped up in the world. You're, the land is beginning to take control of you. The land. He doesn't have to fight you like this. He knows that if the church ever gets entangled with the spirit of the world, he don't have to catch you. He don't have to trap you. He don't have to lay his hands on you. Business can lay its hands on you. Money, greed, attentiveness to the things and the cares of this life can literally trap you like vines that pick up from the ground and swallow up the fleeing foot. And so, he knows. He don't have to catch you and hold you. It's sometimes too hard. Sometimes the devil knows uh, that it's too complicated to chain your tongue and chain your hands and chain your feet sometimes it's too complicated sometimes he just nudges you in the ways of the worldly interventions and off you go and he says I don't have to catch them and trap them and imprison them and say you can't talk to God you can't pray you can't worship you can't go to church you can't be the leader of your home it's too hard to do that I'll just nudge them into the wilderness of life and they'll just get lost out there and become a wandering people there will be an essence about them that they will just wander to and fro and there won't be any stability you never know where they'll end up you never know what they will become this is what Psalm chapter 3 says man when the when they lays it out of all the things that are happening in his life uh, they just become wandering vagabonds they're laid out and and they're wandering to and fro but david doesn't lose his steps when he's being chased through the wilderness David starts praying in the land. How are they increased that trouble me? Many there be which rise up and say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. And David starts crying out to God, don't let me get lost in life. Don't let me get lost in the pleasures of life. Let me come back to God and say, God, what are you trying to do in my life and in my mind? We get trapped in stuff. And you need something strong to break you out of it. You need something stronger than what you're trapped in to break you out of it. You need a, a search and rescue crew. You need, you need somebody with a chainsaw, somebody with a brush cutter, somebody with a brush hog that'll come in and say, let me clear some land for you. Let me cut a path out. Well, let me tell you what church does for you. Church cuts a path out of what you're stuck in you know why you need to be in the house of god we need moves of god strong enough to break what it is that's got a grip on our minds and on our life if you don't come to church faithfully and regularly you know what will happen the land will swallow you up you'll never quit you'll never have the confrontation just little by little it'll grow around you you don't believe what I'm saying today? You don't believe that? Go, on, go online and Google and look up bicycles chained to a tree. Just look it up. It's all over the world. Somebody somewhere chained a bicycle to a tree. They were coming back for it. But as time went on, the tree began to grow. It began to eat the links up. 
It began to bury it. It began, oh, that don't happen in a minute. There was no moment where someone stood and proclaimed a fancy proclamation and said, thou tree, thou shalt eat my bicycle. That never happened. That never happened. But life has a way of entangling and ensnaring. Life has a way of capturing one link of your chain, another link of your chain. If it can get a hold of your faithfulness to the house of God, if it can get a hold of your tithing and offerings and faithfulness to giving and God, if it can get a hold of your prayer life, if it can get a hold of the time that you spend online, if it can grab a few links pretty soon, the bicycle itself, your definition of Christianity is being swallowed up. By what? By a sudden attack of restriction? No. No, not at all. Not at all, my brother. Not at all, my sister. By the land. The land. Quietly, slowly, methodically eating, devouring, chaining, controlling, trapping, imprisoning. And yet nobody resists because it's so incremental. It's such a slow march of encroachment. Restrictions come from that. But nobody screams out, why haven't I been in church in two weeks? Why is my job more important than being in the house of God? Nobody cries out. But let some lame restriction come and it creates a, an uproar of panic and drama. But yet when the land is restricting us, we shrug our shoulders and say, no big deal that I haven't prayed in three or four days. Be careful with that spirit. Be careful. There is a voice from heaven saying, come out from among them and be separate. you got to leave the land that's trapping you. Don't let your kids be trapped in the land. Don't let your children be trapped in the ways of the land. Beware of setting your children and your family in front of Hollywood. There's a spirit in that thing. The movies are subtly telling you it's all right to have an emotional affair. It's all right to look like this. It's all right to act like this. Marriage is redefined. Sexuality is redefined. The entire aura of witchcraft and all that is around it is being systematically redefined. And nobody pushes back the the land reaches out of that screen. The land reaches out of that movie. The land reaches out of that Hollywood star. My problem isn't my problem isn't altogether what they do all the time on the screen. My problem isn't that someone played Jesus or George Washington or or, or some hero of history. I, that's not my real problem. My real problem is it's idolatry when they step off the screen after they have a cult-like quasi-cult following. They begin to tell young people it's all right to believe this and you don't have to believe in that and you don't. And they come against this. Beware of what's reaching out of that screen and trapping your morals and trapping your worldview. We have a Christian worldview. Over 400 times in your Bible. Over 400 times the word is called out by God, come out, come. Come and dine, the master's calling. Come out from among them. Over 400 times there is a clarion call of God saying, come to me. Come closer to me. Fight your way out of that bramble you're held up in. Fight your way out of that lethargy. Fight your way out. Fight you and your family out. And I admit, I, I confess to you today, I make no bones about it. It is easier by far just to throw up your hands and say, what's the use? Why fight this way? Why say anything at all? But you've got to fight. Because if you don't fight back, the land begins to encroach. The land begins to move. Get to the mountains, he says, and rescue them who are in the mountains. Go to them and turn them from darkness into light. Turn them from sinners into saints. Get them wrapped in Christ. Get them entangled. I will probably preach part two of this tomorrow night in our youth service. So if you're a young person, let's get to the house of God. Let's have a move of God. But today, what is the call? What is the message? It is the voice of God saying, Ye that are weary, come and rest with me. 
fight your way out of the frantic, hectic rat race of life. The screams of time and place and busyness reach up and clutch at your every day and every hour. You feel yourself sag. And you feel yourself say, what's the use? I stand here in this pulpit today and I don't preach something I conjure up out of books. I, this is the point God wants me to preach. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will be to you a father and you shall be my sons and you shall be my daughters. But if you don't fight your way out of the land, if you, I don't know what's choking out fruitfulness in your family. The Bible says that one of the four means of, of, of what it was when they cast the seed on the ground, there was four types of ground. One of it was bramble ground or thorny ground. And those thorns began to raise up. That little seed started breaking out of the ground. And, and that little plant began to stretch forth its green leaves. But the bramble and the thorns around it began to grab up that tender little plant. The thorns, the harsh wooden nails of nature began to pierce the tenderness and the fluidity of that small and tender plant. Mark my words today. We're building a church in thorny ground. We're building a church where there's brambles out there, sis. There's brambles out there, Daddy. Mom, there's brambles. Uh, there's thorns that are trying to crush your children's faith, trying to pressure your family. And the voice of God rings from all of these years, uh, from the exodus of old. Uh, come out from among them and be separate. Fight yourself. Fight away from that. Because once the land entraps you, the only thing that's going to get you out of where you're stuck is a move of God more powerful than the grip that holds you. My message today is come out of the land. Come out of that land and walk into the garden of God. Walk in. I can't preach it all this morning. But why do you think he found a garden of Gethsemane to pray in? Why do you think he found a garden? Because gardens are tended. Gardens have manicures. Gardens have intentionality. Don't let that near my tender plant. Don't let that. This church is the garden of God. This is the place we come out of the hustle, out of the bustle, and we stand in well-manicured thought life. And God says, keep this back. Push this stuff back. Don't let these brambles choke out the fruitfulness. This is where we pray. This is where we recalibrate. This is where we revive the stuff dead. Stand with me this morning and let's pray together as they sing. Jesus, would you get us out of the land? Jesus, deliver us from what we're trapped in. Jesus, bring us out. Bring us out of what has got a hold of our fruitfulness. Out of our faithful and unfaithfulness, God. Out of our lethargy and laziness, blindness and naivete, oh God. You walk in this place today.
someone watching online right now. You're sitting in your house right now with your spouse. And it's been a long time since you two have just outright prayed and let the Holy Ghost move in your home in front of your children. And there's tension and awkwardness building up between the relationship. I'm asking you to fight the bramble right now that's holding your hands. I'm asking you right now. I have a word from God. Listen to me, wife. Reach across that table or that couch. Walk across your living room right now and lay your hands on your husband's hands. I don't care if he's a backslider or not. I don't care if he just has drifted off into the land. Lay your hands on him and say, God, God, walk in this room right now with us. We're coming out of the land that's trapped us. If you don't fight past the bramble, brother, if you don't fight past the thorns that's choking out your fruitfulness, you have a ministry, you have an anointing, you have a fruitfulness, but the cares of this life are choking it out. Come on, reach for one another right now in the Holy Ghost. We'll linger a little while. We'll have an online altar call. Daddy, you need to lay your hands on your children. You need to grab them beautiful babies up in your arms uh, and you need to let the Holy Ghost walk in your house. Jesus, help them. Jesus, dispatch your glory into their home right now. Dispatch your anointing into their living room. Break down the resistance. Break down the awkwardness. Let the Holy Ghost... once a week than it is once a year. You just keep coming and cutting on the vine, cutting on the bramble, cutting on the thing that's choking out fruitfulness. And pretty soon you've cleared up a little patch of garden. You manicure it. You make sure that it's all right. Husband, wife, child, I don't care who you are. Keep reaching across wherever that divide is and lay your hands on your family. And say we're not going to go and be swallowed up by the world. We're not a worldly people. We're a godly people. God bless you today. Go in the strength of the word of God. Go in faith that you can come out of whatever it is and come back tonight online. You that are coming tonight, come expecting a great move of God. Every one of these services are unique and God is doing beautiful things. We love you and we'll see you back here the next time we gather.